Today on Inside the Issues, I speak to Dr. David Keith on the subject of climate geoengineering. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week on the program, we welcome an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs here to the studio at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Today our guest is Dr. David Keith. He is the Gordon McKay Professor of Applied Physics in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard and a Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be here. Let me start with a seemingly simple question. What is solar geoengineering? Well, I'll start with a kind of narrow technical answer, and then we'll get into all the hard questions about mm -hmm. who controls it and how it would be governed. But uh, uh, it's the idea that we would put reflecting particles, small aerosols, like the little droplets inside a cloud, into the upper atmosphere, perhaps the stratosphere, to reflect away a little bit of sunlight, to partially and temporarily uh, reduce the climate change that comes from the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And why are some scientists advocating this as a, an important tool to deal with, with climate change? Why is there so much interest in this right now? Well, in many ways, you'd say there isn't much interest in it. Uh, the idea actually is very old. So the core knowledge that this could be done, that it was a potential one of the tools we could use to manage climate risk, that idea goes back to the 1960s, certainly by the early 70s. Uh, but there was essentially a taboo against talking about it. And that taboo in the scientific field really arose because people were terrified that if they talked about this sort of temporary technical fix, uh, people would lose the focus on cutting emissions. So what you see is that this was in fact talked about. It was part of assessments about the climate problem in the late 70s and the early 80s and even the late 80s. But then <coughs> as climate change became more uh, politicized, there was not any kind of secret meeting, but de facto it wasn't talked about until really the mid-2000s when Paul Crutzen published a paper that said roughly what had been said many times before, but he had won a Nobel Prize for ozone chemistry. One of the potential impacts of doing this is uh, damaging the ozone layer and somehow having him say it and uh, also ha having it said at a time where I think people were understanding that maybe we wouldn't get action on cutting emissions quite as fast as, as some hoped, suddenly kind of uncorked the bottle. And now there's certainly a lot of uh, talk and attention, still very little actual research because governments are not really funding research on this topic in a significant way. And, and on that point, has, has any of this been tested yet or is it still very much a, a theoretical idea? Well, it's a theoretical idea, but <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm sort of subscribing to the idea that theoretical ideas right. are weak. Right. I mean, climate change is a theoretical idea too, and indeed it's exactly the same theory with exactly the same enormous body of empirical basis from, from, from basic physics, go back, back to Tyndall and Arrhenius a century and a half or longer ago, to a suite of measurements, including measurements of the impact of volcanoes and aerosols on climate, of which there's you know, thousands or tens of thousands of papers published over 50 years that all kind of bear on understanding how this would work uh, uh, to, to, to the full suite of global climate models uh, that have now essentially all been used to test what happens with this uh, solar geoengineering. So it's a theory, but it's a theory that I would say is kind of roughly as well-founded as a theory that says that increasing uh, amounts of greenhouse gas will change the climate. It's uh, all part of the same body of right. knowledge. Right, and have there actual have there been actually tests? There, there have been no no deliberate tests of any significance anyway right. uh, of of doing this as a sort of deliberate act. I mean, of course, there's lots of things that we do that you could argue give us information. So we right. put 50 million tons or more of sulfur in the lower atmosphere right now, and that cools the climate significantly, and it kills roughly two million people a year. This is the sulfur pollution from mostly right. from fossil fuel use. Right. Um, but other than like one Russian um, kind of deliberately provocative test that didn't really test anything, there has not been any, any test as yet. And my understanding of, of geoengineering is that it's actually not that difficult 
two test. Is that correct? So again, there's uh, geoengineering covers right. a lot right. of ground, including Fair. a bunch of ideas for removing carbon from the atmosphere. I'll leave those aside, but but it wouldn't be that hard in principle to get started. So it, it, if you wanted to change the entire, let's say you wanted to um, cut the rate of climate change by half starting in 2020, in principle, you could do that with a, a, a really a handful of small aircraft at the beginning, you know, going up to maybe 50 or 70 aircraft by 2070, and these would be essentially like re-engined business jets, so you don't require any massive new technology. And, and the, the basic ability to do that and to uh, uh, cut the rate of change of, the rate of forcing, which is a thing that drives climate change, to cut that in half starting in 2020 seems technically feasible. Uh, this is not advocating that it's a good idea, but right. it seems technically feasible. And, and it, important to say for international relations, the core hardware to do that is something that uh, Hindustani Aerospace or Embraer could produce, not just uh, um, uh, the Lockheed Martin. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. David Keith. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back to the program. Dr. Keith, there are critics of geoengineering. What are some of the criticisms and, and what do you make of them? Well, this is an idea that really upsets people. So um, uh, David Suzuki has called it insane. Al Gore recently called it insane and delusional and said mm -hmm. that scientists who were tempted to work on it were you know, deeply misguided and, and really failed to understand the, the problem. Um, uh, uh, Naomi Klein called it a rogue proposition. So th there's any number of commentators who think the issue is completely horrifying. And I think the reason is it doesn't fit into people's preconceptions about the way we manage this problem. And it, um, it terrifies people because of a fear that, that, that we will st stop efforts to cut emissions if we also do this. And a f well founded fear that technological fixes sort of always go wrong. Right. And um, in terms of political will for this, um, are there, uh, is, is there a growing consensus though amongst the scientific community that this is the right course of action given the, the seemingly um, greater risk that climate change poses all the time because we're unable to deal with emissions cuts? So there's so several things I would disagree right. with in that statement. Sure. First of all, we are absolutely able to do emissions cuts on a technical grounds. Right. And, and I think it's very important not to let people off the hook. And also, in the long run, if we don't cut emissions, no amount of geoengineering will protect us. Okay. So if we simply keep burning fossil fuels and accelerating rates forever, <clears throat> we'll walk further and further away from the climate state. And even if you kept uh, reducing the amount of sunlight by doing more and more solar geoengineering, you would get yourself into a progressively more and more dangerous state. So uh, uh, essentially there's nothing you can do in the long run but cut emissions to zero if you want a stable climate. The question is whether or not while you're doing that, it, it might be worth reducing the risks further and whether it would work to reduce the risk further by doing some form of solar geoengineering. And on the question of whether or not there's scientific consensus about this, the answer is simple, absolutely not. Uh, there's a violent disagreement inside the scientific community. I would say there's an increasing uh, uh, acceptance that research on this, at least at the academic level, not uh, doing outdoor tests makes sense. Right. And um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the, the perceived risks of geoengineering and why it, it generates such vitriol among you know, people like David Suki or Al Gore. So I'm not sure the reason it generates vitriol is the same thing as the kind of technical risks as, as the scientific community understands them. I think the reason it generates the vitriol is this kind of sense that it's a trick, sense that it's this end of pipe global solution which goes against a kind of small is beautiful, reduce consumption, change social organization view about, about how we should solve these problems. So there certainly are a bunch of pretty well understood uh, technical risks. So for example, certain ways to do this could uh, 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 damage the ozone layer or really slow down the recovery of the ozone layer that was damaged by, by uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Right. Um, there are versions of this that could cause uh, various changes to local weather that would be dangerous. Uh, there are certainly ways you could use it that would be disastrous. And um, 
does that uh, are are these the reasons why there has yet to be any kind of um, testing that that has been endorsed by either a, a an intergovernmental agency or or a government? Is it because of the these unknowns? Uh, I would say the reason for the current disputes and, and most people's uh, reluctance to contemplate outdoor tests, for example, the stated reasons have to do typically with the list of risks I've said. Right. But I think the underlying reasons actually aren't the stated reasons. The underlying reasons are kind of a, 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 a cultural, a visceral cultural reaction that the thing is dangerous and also a well-founded sense that even if the technology might make sense in the hands of a kind of single global well-intentioned sovereign, it actually uh, uh, could be disastrous in the hands of the actual political elite that run this planet. And um, and on that note, are there um, is is there a sense that in fact um, politicians and the scientific community, or policymakers in the scientific community, just aren't speaking the same language when it comes to this type of, of issue? Um, that they're they're really viewing it from very different lenses that are seemingly incompatible? Uh, I, my sense is many politicians, uh, <coughs> um, I don't see a gigantic difference. Uh, politicians and the scientists who work for them or work for their governments are embedded in the same culture and share lots of common assumptions about what are good or bad solutions. So I don't see a radical divergence. Thank you very much. You have been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back to the program. Dr. Keith, I'd like to focus our discussion on some of the public policy or governance challenges related to geoengineering. Um, you alluded to some of these in the previous section. Um, what are some of the, broadly, what are some of the governance challenges relating to this type of, of activity? Let, let me start from sort of the highest level, I think, a real kind of general thing you could say from the point of view of, <clears throat> of economic game theoretic consideration. So first of all, what's the problem with cutting emissions? The problem with cutting with emissions is a public goods problem where where if you could have some kind of binding global vote, there'd be a range of views. But in fact, many citizens of the planet would like to see much more action on emissions cutting than we're now getting. But we don't get that, not because people are, are fail to understand that it might be a good thing, but because of the sort of core public goods uh, and coordination problem. The fact that if I cut emissions, almost all the benefits fall a century or half a century in the future and they fall globally distributed. So I don't capture many of those benefits. And so it's sort of very hard to get uh, as, as much uh, emissions cuts as you like. So the expectation given the structure of the problem is that you'll have an under provision of, uh, of emissions cutting. And that's exactly what we've seen for half a century. So in many ways, the, the expectation for solar geo sharing is precisely the opposite. So if you imagine, say, a spectrum of 20 countries in the world, just for the sake of argument, and they have different uh, uh, values that they would like to have in terms of the total amount of solar geoengineering. Maybe a lot of them would like zero, but some of them would like a certain amount based on their particular structure of interests. Um, if the thing is automatically global and it's essentially cost-free, and then the expectation would be over-provision. And the reason is whichever country wants it the most gets it, if you like. The thermostat can only get set upwards. Right. And, and, and then um, every other country gets too much. So the kind of underlying problem uh, from, from public policy terms is how to deal with potential over-provision, with it being overdone, and how to uh, get a deal that avoids that, that gets you something closer to some global optimum that gives a, a larger fraction of the world what, what it thinks is the right answer. <clears throat> and building on that, um, one of the criticisms of uh, the climate change governance is that our existing institutions, uh, either at the national or international level or regional level, just are, are so ill-equipped to deal with uh, these, this sort of problem. What is your sense of 
the current architecture, governance architecture around climate change, and whether or not um, it's it's really it has the capacity to undertake something like solar geoengineering. Yeah. I, I certainly don't think that existing institutions could right now do a good job managing something like solar geoengineering. But it's common that technological and social changes are, are forcing us ahead of, of, of our capacity to, to, to manage the global commons. This is only one of many ways in which this is true. And, and technology is going to force us to do new governance or to die, basically, as President Johnson said. Right. Right. And, 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 and that's true, you know, most of all for nuclear weapons, where the whole idea that nation states were, were entities that could, you know, were really sovereign and eventually could settle disputes be between them by war is an idea that, that really doesn't work in a world with nuclear weapons. And I think a fair amount of what we've seen since 1945 is the, the reflection of that. And while there's no single moment that global governance arrives, the world looks very different uh, than it did in 1945 sure. with respect to the, the, the powers that individual states have. That's true for telecommunications. It's true for drug policy. It's true for the fact that you can now get off the internet uh, uh, instructions for how to build viruses that are potentially lethal, and you can make them with machines you can get from eBay. And I don't see how we will, in the end, live stably on this world without having more intrusive and global control of that activity. And it's absolutely true for solar geoengineering. There's only one planet. If we develop, and we appear to have done that, the technological ability to drastically alter the climate, uh, uh, there's, th there can only be one answer uh, at one time. And that requires some form of powerful and legitimate uh, global governance that uh, 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 deals with the potential actions of states that would like to uh, do something purely for their own benefit. And are there uh, currently intergovernmental agencies that are wrestling with, with the issue of, of geoengineering? Yes, uh, at the margin. So certainly uh, the UN Framework Convention dialogue it comes up in, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is an uh, you know, advisory body, if you like, to that. Uh, it, it's a formal part of their reporting now. There are lots of uh, different ways in which it comes up in fora on international relations. Sure. Still not at a high level, uh, with, with one exception, actually. I mean, there was, a, for example, an attempt by Russia to get it on the agenda of a G7 meeting about four or five years ago, and, and uh, that was sort of pushed off by a bunch of backroom negotiation. But, but this thing <coughs> has now bubbled up to the level occasionally of heads of state but still not in a kind of formal dialogue process. Great. Thank you very much. We will be back in a moment with Dr. David Keith. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Dr. Keith, um, one of the things that has struck me about climate change governance is that the North and the South appear to be approaching the issue from very different vantage points. The North seeing it as a, a technical problem that can be solved using technology, whereas the South, the narrative, or my understanding of the narrative, is that it is um, part of a larger argument about social justice and uh, it is part and parcel with is issues of global poverty, of lack of representation, international organizations, uh, et cetera. Is this a fair assessment? I mean, is there a big gulf between the North and South on climate change governance broadly, or, and specifically on geoengineering? Yes, but I'm not sure I'd subscribe to just the way you put it. So, okay. uh, so the, the beginning of, of the way you put it sort of implied that the North looked fundamentally at kind of technological ch changes and the South didn't. I'm not sure I've experienced that in, in, in my experience talking to people in India and China and Brazil and so on. If there's no question that people, I think very legitimately, look at this as a kind of global justice issue in the sense that you can argue that the atmosphere had a certain capacity for carbon and the North has kind of eaten it all up right. and, and the South wants to be able to develop and, and has trouble with a carbon cap. So I think there's a, a clear justice issue there, but I think that's quite different from the question of whether people view the fundamental solution here as being technological change to, to move to energy systems that don't uh, emit carbon. My sense is 
that's widely shared by decision makers in both North and South, that that's the pathway you'd want to go. The question is an argument about who pays and, and who takes responsibility for the existing carbon in the atmosphere. And on that, <coughs> where do countries like China and India and Brazil uh, come into the debate? What are their respective positions? Um, debate on climate or on their signal? So, so on, on, <coughs> on something on, like geoengineering. On, on solar geoengineering, there are not high level positions as yet. So we've certainly organized meetings in China and India and had dialogues with senior people up to cabinet level people, but there aren't formal positions articulated yet and I don't think there will be any time soon. It's, this issue is rising, but it's not there yet. Um, on climate, I, I think China is an utterly different situation from India and, and Brazil. China is the world's largest emitter, and, and I think there's very wide agreement that climate policy very likely turns substantially on uh, an agreement that the U.S. and China would have to make. Right. And do, <coughs> do these countries uh, in the South see um, climate governance as something that would be an impediment to their economic development? Or uh, do they see it as something that can be mutually reinforcing? Well, I think both. So there's certainly been a an effort to couple concerns about climate and poverty, partly for reasons that I think are sensible, partly simply because uh, people who, who want to work to help alleviate poverty in the poorest parts of the world see uh, it is possible to extract money from the richer parts of the world through funds tied to climate change. I'm not convinced that's actually a sensible uh, coupling. Not to say that, that I don't care a lot about both issues, but it's not clear it's a politically sensible coupling that y uses money in a wise way to help, help do the best that can be done to manage poverty. Uh, I think that's quite separate from the question of what the kind of larger rising countries like India or China think about the, the kind of global headroom or right to, to pollute in the atmosphere. And what about small countries and perhaps focusing on, on small island countries? Are they um, taking certain positions on geoengineering? Um, I'm generalizing, of course, but... Um, so, so <coughs> there's, there's, we're a very long way from any country having any significant formal position on this. So there's been a dialogue at a kind of low level, mostly among academics and some NGOs and kind of public intellectuals, mostly centered in the West, and one strain of that dialogue thinks of this as a kind of Western techno fix that will benefit the West and somehow screw the poorer parts of the world. I think that that's probably not actually true in the sense that uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the biggest winners from at least some of the obvious forms of solar geoengineering would in fact be the global south because basically because they're more vulnerable to climate extremes and because uh, uh, they're more likely to benefit from something that in the short term slows down the pace of climate change. But I think how this actually ends up playing out and you know whether small island states end up arguing in favor of rapid solar geoengineering or against is impossible to guess at this point. And perhaps um, just building on that, I'll go back to the analogy you made in the, the last section to nuclear weapons. Um, is this the sort of technology that once it's released, there's no going back? Um, the way the way it was in the 40s with nuclear weapons? Um, yes and no. So yes, in the sense that the basic idea of doing this, once it's out there, once there's a big body of new science, which even without government funding is it, it, sort of happening, and my guess is there will be uh, small-scale tests. These are tiny-scale tests. I'm involved in, in developing one of them. My guess is some of them will go forward, so we'll learn a lot more. That knowledge, once it's out of the, the bottle, so to speak, I think you can't you can't uh, put it back in. Right. Uh, but I think that doesn't commit the world to do it. So I think there's a threshold, just as there's a threshold, I think analogy breaks down a bit, to using uh, nuclear weapons for war. And I could easily imagine that for lots of reasons, wise and not so wise, the world uh, uh, backs off and actually doesn't do this. And it could be, in fact, that the threat of doing this uh, reinforces commitment to, to cutting emissions. Indeed, there are simple game theoretic models you can construct that shows that actually adding solar geoengineering can make a stronger commitment to mitigation. I'm not sure that's that likely an outcome, but, but it can happen basically if countries feel that they need to do more to cut emissions to mitigate the threat that some other country will geoengineer in a way they don't like. Right. Well, thank you very much.
for being on the show. This has been absolutely wonderful. And thank you to our audience for watching. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.